uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this first talk of the year in the Virtual Digital Economy Seminar. Uh, our first moderator this year will be Luis Aguiar in Zurich, and um, he will introduce our uh, first guest in a moment. Um, the talk will follow the same format that we've used in the past two years. So we've been on this for two years, unbelievable. Um, if you have any clarifying questions throughout the talk, please uh, just punch them in in the chat window and uh, Louis will manage the queue and interrupt the speaker at a convenient time for you to ask the question. If you prefer, Louis can ask the question for you as well. We will also collect uh, the remaining questions for the Q&A after the talk in that chat window. So don't hesitate to post questions at any time. Um, also, feel free to turn on your camera. Camera, You don't need to, but feel free to, uh, to give the speaker a bit more of an interactive experience. And uh, today's session will be recorded. So if you do ask a question, you will be on the YouTube recording. So I'm happy to give the mic to Luis. Thanks a lot, Hannes. Uh, welcome, everyone. So we have the pleasure of having uh, Mike Smith today with us. Uh, he is a professor of information technology and marketing at Carnegie Mellon uh, University's Heinz College. So he is a very prolific and influential scholar uh, that you know looks at uh, firm and consumer behavior in online markets. He has made many great contributions uh, to multiple aspects of the digital economy in particular, and how digital technologies have affected the entertainment industries. Uh, his work has been published in all the leading journals, and he ha also has a fascinating book uh, on you know, big data and the future of entertainment. So today he'll talk about uh, the effects of the digital transformation on higher education. So Michael, we are uh, very glad that uh, you joined us today and we're uh, very much looking forward to your presentation. Um, the screen is yours. Fantastic. Uh, Luis, Chris, uh, Hannes, uh, th thanks so much for inviting me. Really looking forward to giving this talk. Uh, thanks for everybody for coming. For whatever reason, Avi Goldfarb, Mike Ward, and Coleman Strumpf are right in my line of vision. So I'm going to be looking at you guys for for the next 45 minutes. Um, but the the so the the talk today is is a little bit different than a normal academic talk. And I've cleared this with Chris up up front. So the confession is that in a in a normal academic talk, I've got data. I've run a thousand different uh, models on the data. I'm gonna show you the results. And if you ask any questions, um, I'm going to show you one of 15, you know, one of, one of 15 backup slides that shows that I'm right and you're wrong. Um, and, the, and the goal of the talk is for you to walk away recognizing that I'm right and you're wrong. Um, the, this talk is different in the sense that I'd kind of like to toss out a concept which is how will digital technology will digital technologies change the the institution of higher education and if so how will that change occur and why hasn't that change occurred already like one of the startling things is when MOOCs have been around for 15 years higher education has been hearing for the last 15 years the technology is going to change how we do business nothing's happened um, and I'm being a little bit a little bit provocative, but you know, sort of that's that's kind of what I'd, I'd like to like to argue today. Um, and I would love your feedback on this. I'm working on a book. Um, and so if you want to say I'm full of crap, you wouldn't be the first and you certainly won't be the last. Um, but I'd, I'd really like to walk away with with, you know, maybe getting you guys to think, but definitely getting, getting me to think about, about some, of these, some of these ideas. Is that fair? And also, if you've, got any, you know, if you've got any clarifying questions as I go along, feel free to ask them. If you've got any non-clarifying questions as, as we go along, uh, feel free to raise them and I'll either table them or, or take them. I'm also gonna try to leave uh, 15 minutes at the end for open Q&A where we can interact, fair? Okay, obviously nodding his head, so we're good, we're in good shape. So this is this is the standard digitization slide that we all give on the first day of class. Uh, digitization is is different because it involves high fixed cost, uh, zero zero marginal cost, high fixed cost of production, zero marginal cost of reproduction. It's a non rival good, perfect replication. It has different economies of scale. Um, it creates an abundance of detailed data about customer behavior 
and it frequently causes significant changes to firms, markets, and industries. And so the, the question I'd like to ask is, do these same characteristics apply to higher education? And if they do, what might that look like, right? So what might it look like to have a new way of teaching where there was a high fixed cost associated with creating the content the first time, but after you do that, there's zero marginal cost of, of, of reproducing it. And I'm, I'm being a little bit provocative. I see, I see Coleman's face and Coleman, we can, we can get to your objection in a second. Um, what would happen if education was delivered in a way that was non-rival, where adding an additional student to the class didn't displace an, another student? Um, are, are the economies of scale associated with digital delivery different? Um, what can we or should we do about data on student behavior? And then maybe the most, most uh, salient question is, you know, what might this do to our industry? Okay. So this talks come about in what I'll call uh, uh, three different stages. So the first stage was some research that uh, some colleagues and I were doing on digital data in the context of quote unquote learning. So we got data from um, masterclass.com. I assume most people are familiar with, with masterclass. It's, it's not exactly education. It's more like uh, Shonda Rhimes teaches you how to write a television show. Um, what they gave us was data on 770 of their online courses, 2.6 million viewing records of about a, about a quarter of a million their, of their students. And what we tried to do was take that data, combine it with some standard off the shelf machine learning techniques that would characterize the, the characteristics of the video. You know, is the person speaking, smiling or frowning? How much are they moving their hands? What's the sentiment of the words they're using? How fast are they talking? And, and what we did is we correlated those characteristics of the delivery with student engagement or with viewer engagement. Does, does, can you predict whether someone's going to watch the next episode of a masterclass uh, uh, class based on the characteristics of the previous episode? And, and the answer we found was yes. And this is a paper that came out in the Journal of Marketing Research recently. Um, and, and what I did as I was presenting the paper is I started to talk to different faculty audiences about, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could use detailed data about students to change how we deliver education in the same way we've seen data change so many other areas of the economy? Um, because I study entertainment, I have obviously leaned heavily on entertainment examples, right? Like, wouldn't it be cool that if instead of delivering exactly the same episode of a TV show in prime time to your whole audience, I could actually customize who gets what episode, um, you know, the, the difference between broadcast television and what we have on Netflix. And what I heard back, um, you know, a big part of what I heard back from talking about this was a good deal of anger and, and uh, you know, skepticism, anger might be too strong, skepticism about the possibility of, of, using, of using data to change how we deliver education. And there were two broad streams of that skepticism. One was you can't use data to replicate the teacher. That, that the real important, valuable part of education is having a teacher in the classroom whose students can, you know, talk with casually after class and, um, you know, that, that high quality education has to be delivered in person. Um, and just to, just to head off the question at the pass, uh, I've given this talk in, in synchronous seminars uh, in, in a bunch of different contexts. And, and like I said, pretty, pretty quickly in, in the talk, somebody raises their hand and says, no, 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 you can't, online education is inherently inferior to the high quality education we deliver in person. Um, and and what I, what, you know, the next thing I'd say is, oh, well, that's interesting. Tell me about why online education is less valuable 
than in-person education. And they come up with a long list of, of reasons. And then what I'd say is, well, how much value, how much less valuable is online education? You know, do you think it's like 20% less valuable, 50% less valuable? And they generally refuse to, to give a number, but they'd say, you know, it's at least 20% less valuable. And then the last question I'd ask is, how much of a tuition discount did your university offer for the inferior education we've delivered to students over the past year? And if the answer is zero, you know, what do you make of that? Unpack that for me. So I'd be happy to talk about that. You know, if somebody wants to yell at me about that, but like I say, on one hand, our argument was you can't use, you can't deliver high quality education online. The other one and the other argument I heard, and it wasn't quite this plain, but the, the argument was if you open up access to higher education to everyone, you're gonna dilute the quality of the education because you're gonna, you're gonna give it to people who aren't smart enough to consume it, okay? What I found interesting about these two ob objections is they, they match pretty closely objections that we heard from the entertainment industry about the rise of data. So this is John Landgraf, CEO of FX Television. There's a whole thing going on in Netflix right now and in Silicon Valley saying, we're gonna use algorithms to make creative decisions. I say, posh, you can't. And then Carlton Cuse, an Emmy Award winning showrunner says, hey, the, the increase in in access to the channel that we're seeing from new technologies is going to diminish the quality of entertainment in the same way that if the NFL suddenly expanded to have 90 teams, you'd have a whole lot more football available to you, but the overall quality of it would be diminished. Okay. So that's version one of this. Uh, Mike? Yeah, yeah, you, sure. Please. Yeah. yeah uh, Abby has written in the chat. I don't know, Abby, if you want to ask a question or I don't know if it's just maybe a comment. No. Okay. So we can talk about it later. It was related to market power in the short run. But we'll get there, Avi. Yeah. Now I've, I'm pulling up the chat just, just so I can just like, so yeah, we'll we'll get there. So Avi, I assume your argument is we have market power in the short run. And that might change in the long run. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, so the second version of this was an article I wrote in The Atlantic that basically said. To me, what I'm hearing in higher education in 2020 sounds a whole lot like what I heard from the entertainment industry in 2015. We're immune from technological change. And in fact, if you incorporate a technology into our business, you'll damage the quality of stuff. Do we really believe that we're the one industry in the economy that's immune to technological disruption? Um, and what was kind of fun is, is, and I'm not claiming any causality here, but uh, it, the, the, a month after I, I you know, wrote this, uh, Michael Roth, uh, the president of Wesleyan University, said, business school professors and technologists declare that college as we know it, it's over. We've seen this movie before and college has survived it. And at about the same time I wrote my article, um, Michael Drake, then president of OSU, now chancellor of the UC system, gave a talk that, that basically said, I don't see higher education changing. And, and the reason we're not gonna change because of technology is because we haven't changed, power in our industry hasn't changed over the past 500 years. And he actually cited a book by Clark Kerr that said, you know, there've been 85 institutions in the world that have been more or less unchanged over the past 500 years. Uh, 15 of those institutions are the Catholic Church, a few Swiss cantons, some, uh, some areas of parliament, and the other 70 are higher education institutions. So this particular objection struck me because it was very similar to an objection that we'd heard in 2015 from a major studio executive. So we had the president of home entertainment from one of the big six studios come to our class in 2015. Um, and my colleague Rahul during the Q&A time asked him, again, 2015, um, are you at all worried about the threat that Netflix, Amazon, and Google pose to your business? And his response was, you know what, my business is different. The original six players, you know, the original players in my industry have been around for the past hundred years. There's a reason for that. And the implication was that's not going to change. Okay. So what, whoops, sorry. So 
what I set out to do was to try to try to explore that question. Um, you know, why has it been? Because he's right. You know, why has it been that 70, 70 institutions of higher education have dominated the industry for the last 500 years and have been relatively stable? And why might today be different? So the, the questions I'm trying to answer in this book is, A, will technology change the nature of power in higher education? Will technology hurt the quality of education? And then what should higher education leaders do to respond? Um, and just to give you a shameless plug for the book, what I'll say is these are exactly the same questions Rahul and I tried to answer in our book, Streaming, Sharing, Stealing, Big Data and the Future of Entertainment. I'll just mention as an aside, every time somebody buys one of these, I get $1.25 in royalties. So, you know, uh, they, make, they make a great, uh, great course text for almost any class you might teach. Um, but what, what I'd like to do is kind of run through quickly my thinking on each of these, on each of these questions. And, and I'd love to get your feedback on this. So the, the first question is, will technology change power in education. When we looked at this in the context of entertainment, our argument was the reason that entertain, the reason that the same six big studios have been so powerful for the last hundred years is the classic strategy answer. And I'm looking at you, Avi, uh, that you know, the big studios were able to control scarce resources. And the three scarce resources they controlled were the scarce financial and technical resources you needed to make content access to the scarce channels you needed to distribute content and the ability to use copyright law to create an artificial scarcity and how consumers got access to content. And none of the technological innovations they'd faced over the last hundred years had changed any of those, those sources of scarcity. The thing that was going on in 2015 was they were facing a series of technological changes that were suddenly making those three sources of scarcity abundantly available. And by the way, it was creating a new source of scarcity that I'll call customer attention. And customer attention is owned by Netflix, Amazon, and Google, not you, the studio, okay? So parallel that argument to, to higher education, what I'm gonna argue is that higher education has its own sources of scarcity. Um, we have scarcity and access to the, to the classroom seats. We have scarcity and access to, to we control scarcity and access to, to, to uh, faculty, right? If, if you want to take a class from, from Chris Pukert, you have to be admitted to his school. And if you're not, you're screwed. Um, you might have to learn from me instead, okay? And then the last source of scarcity we have is, I'll argue, scarcity in access to the credentials or market signals that a student needs to signal their talent to, the, to, to future employers. That's what's been going on since 1520. I think starting with the rise of MOOCs in 2011, we saw abundance in the first two resources. But I'm gonna argue that we still, we in higher education still control that last, that last scarce resource. And, and I'm gonna argue provocatively, I sort of feel like that's what's holding our business model together right now. That, yeah, you can take as many classes as you want on edX and Coursera, but no one's going to take it quite as seriously as they would a Carnegie Mellon degree. Um, and the, so that, that raises an interesting question. Could that change? Um, and I swear to you, I was, I was scratching my head as I was writing the book one day. And I was saying, you know, sort of higher education is really a brand and brand are, brands are these enduring things that don't, you know, don't change value very quickly. What might it take to change the value of a University of Toronto um, a brand name? And thank you, Abby. Um, and, you know, what, what might it change to change the brand name? And, and I swear to you, later that day, I was sitting at my desk ordering a very expensive scanner from a manufacturer I'd never heard of before, solely because it had a 4.9 star rating on Amazon and a bunch of positive reviews. And I was like, oh crap, that's how you change the, the value of brand. You make information abundant. Um, that I'll stay with complete strangers 
solely because they have a good rating on Airbnb. I'll drive home with complete strangers solely because they have a good rating on, on Uber. You get where I'm going. What's the parallel in the context of higher education? Here's an article, a 2017 article in Wired Magazine that basically tells the story of um, Gilberto Titoretz, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Anyway, Gilberto uh, is a, Gilberto went to the 16th top ranked Brazilian engineering college and got a degree in petroleum engineering. He works for the Brazilian state oil company. And it just so happens that in his evenings, he likes to participate in Kaggle data analytics challenges. And learning from the Kaggle community, he's actually risen to the top of the worldwide Kaggle data analytics leaderboard. And all of a sudden he's starting to get offers from Silicon Valley companies, not because of his degree, not because of his grades, not because of his work experience, but solely because they can see you're at the top of the Kaggle leaderboard, you must be a good data analyst. Um, I won't belabor the point, but a whole bunch of tech companies are getting into this game, saying basically, we're gonna vertically integrate into the creation of education. We're gonna create our own degrees and certificates, and we're gonna use those degrees as, as an equivalent signal to a university degree. Google in particular has been quite um, vocal about the fact that they've looked at their data and what they find is the, the correlation between where you graduated from, what your major was, what your GPA is. There's very little correlation between your college credentials and success at Google once you factor in Google's entrance exam. Like, you know, so what, what they're saying is I can learn almost everything I need to know about you just based on your entrance exam. I don't need you to tell me where you graduated from college or what your degree was in uh, or what your GPA was, okay? So this will be familiar to anybody who teaches Michael Spence and signaling. Um, second question is, will technology hurt the quality of education? Um, and to think about this question, I'd like to introduce you to Molly Smith. Um, Molly was recently admitted to Carnegie Mellon's uh, mechanical engineering program. Uh, this is an actual picture of Molly Smith's room. Um, my wife and I try to come in every now and then and clean it up. And in about, about 45 minutes, it looks exactly like this. The other thing you should know about Molly is that Molly is president of the Steminist Society at her high school. So feminism plus STEM, Steminism um, is a big thing to her. Now, when she, at the beginning of COVID, she wanted to take AP physics and the policy at her university, at the policy at her high school was, you can't take AP physics unless you've taken AP calculus and you can't take AP calculus unless you take pre-calculus and we're not offering pre-calculus this semester during COVID. Um, and so you're not gonna be able to take AP physics in your senior year. And me as her dad said, well, screw that. Um, you know, there are plenty of ways you can learn calculus online. And in fact, there's a company called Outlier who has a calculus class that um, gives credit for people who finish the calculus class will get credit at the University of Pittsburgh. And so my going in position was, hey, if Molly passes, passes out Outlier's calculus class and, and gets course credit at Pitt, are you really going to tell me that that's not a good enough class to get course credit at this high school? Um, to motivate that, would, would you mind if I just played you a two minute, uh, a two minute clip that shows the, um, the trailer for Outliers Calculus class? And just munch on that for a second, a trailer for a calculus class. So Mike Ward and Avi Goldfarb seem to be fine with this. I'll show you this clip. If you have a little bit of anxiety around the idea of taking calculus, I would encourage you to give it a chance. We don't all learn in the same way. So we are going to be teaching the same content in different ways. I'd say my teaching style is somewhat laid back. I'm the only instructor that's using a blackboard. And I prefer a fountain pen and paper. I want to make calculus a bit more human. I'll be teaching with a tablet. We're gonna look at the infinitely large, the infinitely small. 
there's going to be a lot of storytelling alongside the calculus. I hate to do this to my hometown team, but we're going to look at the Buffalo Bills fan base as our example for exponential decay. So here we go. Low D high minus high D low over low low. What? Let's piece it together. There are these mathematical functions in the things that make us happy. This is an example of taking something in the real world and giving you more information through the equations. Basically, if you're in your 20s, Enjoy it while it lasts. There is no reason why everyone shouldn't have access to the very best education. I hope this course can be a gateway to help students from different backgrounds to start their college career. Calculus is this place where once you've mastered the rules, you can let your curiosity run completely riot. Welcome to Calculus One. Let's get started. Let's get started. Let's get started. All right. So, and again, I get no commission from them. So this, this is, this is for educational purposes, but the, so interesting trailer, right? I've never seen a trailer for a calculus class before. The other thing that's interesting about this class is they don't ask you if you've taken pre-calc. They ask you to take a short quiz of your background math knowledge. And if you pass that quiz, they, they allow you in. They also give you a full refund if you do the work in the class and don't pass, um, which, which we could go back to non-rival non and zero marginal cost and understand why that is. The third thing they do that's really interesting is you saw those three teachers. Each of those teachers teaches exactly the same topic in their own voice. And what they say is, you know, look at the different teachers and uh, explore their classes. And if you want, you know, swap professors, right? So if you, if you start with one professor and their particular way of teaching doesn't make sense to you, um, take, take a different class, take a different professor. Uh, and so the, the question to you guys, and I'll, I'll, I'll watch the chat, which, which professor do you think my Steminist daughter, Molly, gravitated towards? And yeah, it's a leading question. Molly, Molly immediately gravitated towards Hannah Fry. And, and what was interesting is, you know, so I was talking to a colleague about this and I was saying, you know, isn't it interesting that, that Molly immediately wanted to take a class from the, the, the female professor? And they sort of looked at me with this sad, you know, this sad expression and said, Mike, clearly you don't know the literature. There's a whole literature on this. Um, and in fact, there's, there's a bunch of literature that says that there's a gender performance differential between men and women when it comes to STEM classes, typically. And that gender performance differential goes away when the class is taught by a woman. And by the way, there's a similar literature that talks about a performance differential between majority race people and, and uh, uh, black and brown kids um, and how that differential goes away when the person teaching the class looks like the, the people who aren't in the majority um, ethnicity. Um, kind of interesting, okay? You can't do this in a physical classroom, but it, it sure looks like it might be helpful for people like my daughter if you can allow her to take the class at her own pace and allow her to learn from someone who might show her that even though most people look like white guys like me, there are a bunch of people who look like you who've actually been successful in this field. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, a, Mike, uh, role model or selection bias. Actually, one of the studies is, was done at the Air Force Academy. Um, and, and the Air Force Academy actually randomly assigns cadets to uh, two classes. So it's, it's nearly a, a true randomized assignment, at least in that case. Um, good question, okay? So I think you could make a pretty compelling argument that by using technology, we could increase the quality of education. I'll just briefly say there's another reason to think we might be able to increase the quality of education is that our current educational system, at least in the US, I won't speak for any other countries, but at least in the US, disproportionately and, and tragically disproportionately advantages the wealthy. Um, 
And, and so this is the, the uh, President Truman um, in 1947 uh, ordered a study of higher education um, and the study's authors came back and said, the democratic community cannot tolerate a society based upon education for the well-to-do alone. If college opportunities are restricted to those in higher income brackets, the way is open to the creation and perpetuation of a class society which has no place in the American way of life. Um, stirring words, right? Here's the problem. 70 years later, um, uh, Raj Chetty at Harvard studies who actually gets access to elite colleges, where elite is defined as the top 80 most selective schools in the United States. And what he discovers is if you're a kid born into the top 1% of income in the United States, you've got a one in four chance of going to an elite college. If you're born into the bottom 20% of income, you've got a one in 300 chance of going to the same elite college. Um, and, and what I'll say provocatively and, and somewhat cautiously, since I know this is being recorded, please know that I'm being provocative. Um, what I'll say provocatively is, hey, I'm an economist. I believe in the efficient allocation of scarce resources. Higher education, particularly elite higher education is a scarce resource. If we genuinely believe there's a strong correlation between intelligence and capability and your parents' income, then our current system is doing a great job, right? But if you don't believe there's a strong correlation between those two things, then we're doing a terrible job of allocating the scarce resource. And if anything, it sure seems like things are getting worse, not better. So this is a chart from, from Raj Chetty's study that sure looks like the top 1% are grabbing a, a larger share of access to, to elite colleges. And you might say, Mike, elite colleges don't matter. Um, I'd point you to a whole literature that says they do, and Mike Ward would agree with me. But the other thing is, this extends throughout higher education, um, that if you look at all college degrees, you're much more likely to obtain a bachelor's degree if you're in the top quartile than if you're in the bottom, bottom quartile. Um, Bunch of other quotes, uh, uh, college, college rates have soared in the upper incomes. Those with family incomes below $42,000 have barely budged. Instead of acting as a leveler, higher education magnifies economic differences and reinforces them. Um, and this one, which I think is the most poignant one I've come across, Elite College's missions is at root a story of class warfare. This is not directly attributable to any fault or any desire on the part of admissions deans. It's simply a byproduct of the parameters within which the system operates. And I'd be happy to expand on this in the Q&A, but in the book, I'm trying to make a pretty compelling argument that what I think is a pretty compelling argument that we in higher education know what the problem is and we know how to solve it. It's just that no one has the incentives to solve it. Um, and I use the example of Georgia State University, which actually was very intentional about trying to increase access for lower income kids. Georgia State University now admits more students on Pell Grants, which, is, which in the US is our grants set aside for low income students, deserving low income students, more Pell Grant students than the entire Ivy League. Um, so they made this wonderful change in how they did business and as a result of that change, they dropped by 42, 42 slots in the US News and World Report rankings, okay? So just hang out with that for a second. I've got 10 minutes and what I'd like to do is argue that, you know, so I, again, my, the argument I'm trying to create in the book is this is a systemic problem. And because it's a systemic problem, we're unlikely to be able to solve it by tweaking the existing system. The only way we're gonna solve it, and I love pushback on this, is by, by creating a, a parallel system um, that, uh, that, that, that gets outside of the constraints of our current system, okay? Nine minutes, um, how should higher education leaders respond? One thing I found in the entertainment industry was people in the entertainment industry initially and rightly saw technology as a threat to their business model. So when technology was initially introduced, 
the nice people whose bonus was, was made based on selling DVDs looked at this and said, this is going to hurt my ability to, to sell DVDs, which in turn is going to hurt my bonus. Therefore, I don't want to do it. Um, at some point, I saw the entertainment industry start to make the transition to see the value of technology. And I, I swear to you, I, I was sitting in a studio executive dining room with the showrunner for a television show that had recently been sold to Netflix. And in hushed tones, he leaned forward and said, go watch the season of my show that Netflix just put out. And you'll see that it's in every way superior to the quality of the show that we were making on the lot. The cinematography is better, the storytelling's better, and I just can't figure out what's going on. Um, that what the, the, the assumption was Netflix and Amazon are gonna make worse quality shows. What the award shows typically say is they're actually making some great quality entertainment. Um, I, I think that the entertainment industry started at some point to say, hey, our mission isn't selling plastic discs. Our mission is making great entertainment and getting that entertainment in front of, the, in front of an audience. If we can use technology to fulfill our mission, I'm willing to adopt it, even if it involves changing my business model, which it did. Okay, fair? Where am I going with this? I'm not convinced we in higher education know what our mission is. Um, and yeah, I'll be provocative about that. And, and I, since I have tenure, I can pick on my home institution, but I would invite you to go look at the mission, and, mission statement of your institution. And I suspect it looks a lot like a lot like Carnegie Mellon's. You can read this mission statement 10 times and still have absolutely no idea what the mission of Carnegie Mellon is. Um, I had my, I had Kristen Yeager, who's my, who's my research assistant on this product. I, I, I had Kristen go out and scrape the mission statements for the top 10, um, uh, top 10 universities in the US News and World Report. And what she found is the average length of a university mission statement in the top 10 is 87 words. And if you read them, they're completely impenetrable, okay? I then said, Kristen, would you mind going out and scraping the mission statements for the top 10 most valuable brands? And what she found is the average word length is 30 words. And if you read them, they're actually very clear about what the mission of the institution is. Our mission is to organize in the world's information, make it universally accessible and, and, and useful. That's a mission statement, friends. Um, and then the last thing I asked you to do is go out and scrape the mission statements for the top 10 educational platforms. And what she found was their average length was 26 words, and or, I'm sorry, 23 words. And in many cases, they're just darn clear, right? So this is Khan Academy. Our mission is to provide a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. That's a mission statement. Um, what I'm trying to argue in the book, and this goes back to Avi's point about market power in the short run. After giving this talk in a bunch of different places, I'm pretty convinced that we in higher education have been able to forestall market change because we know we still control the credential and we don't wanna change because change would hurt us. And I guess what I'm trying to argue is that I wonder whether we want to A, clarify what our mission is um, and then B, think hard about whether technology might be able to allow us to better fulfill our mission, even if it changes our business model, all right? Last five minutes of the talk, I really just wanted to riff a little bit on, you know, A, I'd love feedback on the book, um, but, but B, I think this is a really cool area of research for digitization scholars. Like we are on the cusp of the introduction of a whole bunch of really cool, really detailed data about how students learn. Um, data that's never been available to, to educators at this scale or, or with this ease. And I sure wonder whether there are a lot of studies that could be done using this data that kind of parallel the studies we as digitization scholars have been doing in other industries over the course of the last 15, 20 years. Um, and, and I guess with that, I will simply say, I would love to have you guys yell at me 
um, or, or, or interact on this topic. And um, I'll open it up to questions. Thanks a lot, Mike, uh, for this super, super interesting talk, very thought provoking. So we have, um, yeah, about 19 minutes left. So plenty of time for, uh, you know, discussions or questions. And I, I can see the, the hand cue. So Avi, you're first in my queue. And you have to unmute, I think. Can you unmute? Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Now, there we go. Okay. Uh, there we go. This is really, really uh, amazing. Um, lots of things going on in my head, including ideas for my new book, my own new book. Um, Just don't now, put it out before my new book, all right? No, no, no. Well, it might be, but it's uh, going to be about a different topic. So you don't all right, good. Before. Fair. Okay. Otherwise, I'd ask, I'd ask you to be remuted. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, you framed it as existing higher ed against, you know, new startups. And it seems to me, this was my point earlier, like yeah. the biggest opportunity is for Carnegie Mellon yeah. um, to figure out how to do this. Now it's hard for us to do it for all the classic disruption challenges reasons. Yeah. But it seems like we already have the brands, at least, you know, you guys, have, you know, so, some of us already have the brands. Carnegie Mellon certainly you, has the brand. Trevor Why not? Brand. Why, why isn't it the opportunity for Carnegie Mellon? Like, here's, so yeah, chapter, chapter eight, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, what's really intriguing to me is MIT and Harvard saw this, right? edX, um, great platform. And, and when you dig down into it, as they rolled it out, there was a whole lot of, of objections from the faculty to the idea that we're gonna change our business model to go after this new opportunity. Um, edX, as you know, was recently sold to a for-profit company um, because they couldn't get traction from, from with, because they were moving too slowly, responding to faculty objections, they were moving too slowly and they had to move it into a separate for-profit company to move fast enough to grab, them, grab the market opportunity. Um, so, but yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Abby. Sorry, that makes me think, sure, it's not MIT, Harvard, or Stanford, but there's a whole tier of universities that think of ourselves as top 20, mm -hmm. like 100 of us. Um, yep. Some of us could take advantage of that. Um, I sure it's just that faculty are pain? I, I think it's, I, honestly, I think it's faculty are pain. Okay. Um, I, I, don't, I, I honestly don't think it's more complicated than that. Okay. Um, much more, it's a little bit more complicated, but I, I think that's at the core of the problem. I, I don't know, do you, do you teach Shane Greenstein's um, Encyclopedia Britannica case? I have, yeah. Yeah, so I love that case because you, you, the, the first question you ask the students is, who can tell me why Britannica was so powerful? It's a, for, for those of you who don't teach it, it's a case about Encyclopedia Britannica around the time Microsoft introduced in Carta an encyclopedia on CD-ROM. And you start by saying, who can tell me why Britannica was so successful in their core market? And the answer is they had great editorial content, they had a great brand name, and they had a great sales force. And about 40 minutes into the class, you say, so why is Britannica, who's been so successful, having such a hard time responding to the entry of an encyclopedia on CD-ROM? And the answer is they have great editorial content, they have a great, a great brand name, and they have a great sales force, and none of those strategic assets are all that useful in this new marketplace. Um, and to, to nail home the point, Avi, what I sometimes say at the end of class is, by the way, for you students, you should recognize that the Encyclopedia Britannica case doesn't apply everywhere, that there's some, some, some organizations who are immune from this sort of, of disruptive change. Like, I don't know, Higher education, for example, we have nothing to worry about when it comes to technology disrupting our business. And the students will do what Avi is doing, you know, they'll sort of nod and they'll go, wait a second. And I go, no, 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 no. You've clearly misunderstood the case. The, the key point of the case is that Britannica had these very self-interested, narrow-minded salespeople who were unwilling to trade their high commissions for, for a lower commission. Whereas we in higher education have highly educated faculty like me who teach this stuff and are gonna be perfectly willing to change, right? And Coleman's rolling his eyes, that's exactly what the students do. So that's, that's the point is I think, I think we in higher education recognize that 
educational delivery is going to scale, is going to have a very different scale characteristic than what we have today. And it's going to mean a lot of people, possibly me, are going to be out of jobs and we want nothing to do with that. Um, one of the readings I have for class is this wonderful New York Times article that interviews someone, I've forgotten what business school it is, but basically says that the question is, how many calculus professors do you, do you think you need to teach online? And the answer, the answer the administrator gives back is maybe five, you know, one to teach in English, one to teach in, in, in Hindi, one to teach in Mandarin, and a few people on the bench in case one of those people dies. Avi, did I answer your question? Yeah, I'll push you on it later, but- uh, All right, that's Mike Ward. Uh, I actually have read your book and actually assigned it to students too. Uh, so bless bless you kind, sir. <laughs> yeah, you might get some more royalties. Um, the, uh, one of the things you point out about the studio execs is that they uh, threw away all this, uh, or they, didn't, they dismissed all this analytic data on the con consumer uses. They don't want to be bothered with this. And so Netflix and Google and Amazon took it up. Well, I, I have that sort of same data for me on my lear learning management system, and I pretty much ignore it. I don't have an incentive really to use it. And so here's where I see the problem with the universities adopting this model is that, that we did partner at one time with a private company that recruited people into these classes, online classes, and they use this all the time, make sure people are doing their homework and you know, they're professional naggers. So you know, just an insight. I don't know if you want to respond to that. No, I, I think it's a great insight, right? And again, I'm just as selfish as anybody else. You, you say you're going to have to teach a class online this coming semester because of COVID. And you look and you say, well, I could invest a whole lot of time and effort to create a class that's customized for online delivery and deliver it probably once because COVID is going to be over in six months. We all know that. Um, irony intended. Uh, or I could do the same thing that's always worked in the past and hope for the best. And, and guess what I did, right? Um, the other thing I've, I've given this, so one of the things that I find interesting about the, the masterclass, I'm sorry, the outlier trailer is the quality of video production. And at another talk I gave, somebody in the audience said, hey, at my college, we just don't have the resources to make that high quality of, of video, so we're never going to do it. Um, and my response was, the key thing you need to know is you only have to do it once and only one person has to do it, right? So if, if, if Outlier does it, they automatically have that, they've automatically have, have uh, taken on that fixed cost and have the learning associated with how do we create great online education. Um, I think by waiting, we're going to have a tough time catching up, friends. Um, Mike, I think I answered your question, did I? It seems like there was one other part to it. Okay, other, other questions? Unati, in, in the chat, I'm watching- Hello? You. Yeah, in the chat, I'm watching you. You say online courses tend to li live long after professors die. Um, I, do, I, I am a huge fan of, of Clay Christensen. We sadly lost our colleague um, uh, recently. What I find interesting is he's still listed as the instructor of record on Harvard's class on digital transformation, right? That, you know, you're, you're learning, you're, you're, you're hearing Clay Christensen, the father of this theory, deliver a lecture, you know, deliver a talk on how his theory works. That's an amazing thing. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. And I'm very, very excited about your book personally. One thing I did want to say about question two that you raised about education quality. Yeah. If in the book you could talk a little bit more about learning outcomes and just measuring what is quality given so many different business models. And this is where education is truly different from entertainment because we, are, we care about those outcomes. So how do we measure those given the different kinds of business models you know, Netflix won't ever test you on your knowledge. How much do you remember from a show you watched? But Coursera would. So I would love to see some kind of convergence on how do we measure learner quality when there's just so many options in this still emerging in this transitioning uh, landscape. 
Uh, two, two thoughts on that, right? Early in the days of Netflix, the objection from TV executives to Netflix was Netflix will fail because no one's watching, there not, aren't enough people watching their shows. Like they looked at the number of people watching any individual Netflix show and it was nowhere near as many viewers as they were getting in primetime television. And they concluded that Netflix was inferior to primetime television, okay? I'd argue that's, that's the wrong metric, right? Metric, Netflix doesn't care how many people watch any individual shows. Netflix cares who's going who's gonna to subscribe next month. What's the parallel? The objection to online courses that you commonly hear is the completion rate is nowhere near as high as the completion rate of in-person classes. Again, I'd argue that's the, that's the wrong metric to use. When you only have a fixed number of, of seats in the class, yeah, completion rate is the right metric to use because if somebody doesn't finish the class, it means I could have replaced them with somebody else who would have finished the class. Fine, right? It's just, it just doesn't apply in a non-rival, zero marginal cost world of digital, digital education. The metric ought to be, what did you learn? And did it change your, your trajectory? Um, that's what I think we ought to be studying in higher education. And at the risk, I'll anonymize the, the, this example, um, but uh, me and Pedro Ferreira came up with a way that we thought would be really cool to study this using available data that was, that was generated during Zoom education. And so the question we were trying to ask was, was the education we delivered during the pandemic higher, lower, the same quality outcomes as the education we delivered in person? And we pitched this to two universities. And while no one was quite this frank, the answer we got back was, I don't wanna know the answer, because whatever you find, it's bad for me. If you find that online education is better, then that destroys my business model. And if you find that online education was worse, then all the people suing me for tuition refunds are gonna, are gonna ask for discovery on that finding, right? I'll just roll that out there. I'll roll that grenade out in the middle of the room. But yeah, I think, I think we need, we in higher education need to think really hard about what is the outcome we want to measure? Um, one thing I've been playing around with is what happens to these students who don't finish the class, right? We in higher education tend to have this binary outcome. You either pass the class or you don't pass the class. What if you don't finish the class, but you still learn something? How do we, how do we, you know, how do we interpret that? Other thoughts? So there were a couple of uh, comments in the in in, in the chat. Uh, Chris, for instance, was asking, uh, which is also something I, I'm curious about, whether you think this uh, could lead to specialization, either teaching or research, rather than trying to do both at the same time. Yeah, the, this. Yeah, I, I saw that. I just I, I, I can only keep I can only keep a half an idea in my head at once. But yeah, I, I think this could lead lead to specialization in teaching and research. To be honest, I think it could lead to specialization in both in the following sense, right? Like to become, to become a tenured professor, you have to become the world's recognized expert in a really narrow part of your field, right? But when we teach, we teach like generalists. You know? So my value as a scholar is I'm a specialist, but when I teach, I teach like a generalist. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I could teach my specialty? Uh, Luis, you could teach your specialty. Avi, you teach your specialty. Mike Ward teaches his specialty. Chris Coleman, I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, and and then we have, you know, we have a, another layer that says, hey, um, who haven't I picked on? Hannes, you know, given your background as a student, here are the here are the classes I think you need to to learn to get your to get yourself to the next level. And I'm going to give you a little bit of Christian, a little bit of a little bit of Chris, a little bit of Abby, a little bit of Coleman, almost none of Mike. And you're going to be a smarter person at, at the end of the day than if you were to just learn from one of us. That's that's very much a winner take all outcome. 
Um, and just to be a little bit provocative, it reminds me of um, a paper by a guy on our faculty um, who's an economic historian, and he studied the labor market for performing artists before and after the rise of broadcast television. And, and what he said is prior to the rise of broadcast television, when performances were local, there was a very robust local market for, for performing artists, right? Every city had its own playhouse. And if you were the 12th best uh, uh, actor who plays Hamlet, you had a job. After the rise of broadcast television, it became a winner take all outcome. Um, and you had Tom Hanks and basically everybody else. I'll just toss that out there with no further comment. Coleman, you've been disturbingly quiet, but you look like you're thinking. You're not thinking? Okay. No, sorry, I, I'm, I'm fumbling with the mute. I don't really have any deep thoughts on this one. Um, so I'll, I'll hold off and let, let, right, others, fair and let others chime in. Okay, thank you for letting me cold call you. Any, any, anybody pissed off? Like if I, if I, if I'm full of crap, feel free to tell me. So, so maybe, maybe I can, I can ask a question or maybe it's a comment. I'm not quite sure. It's not an angry one at least, um, but it's probably more my ignorance. And uh, so, so, so I, I think your talk was really great and, and it appeared quite normative um, at points, which I actually appreciate. Um, uh, of course that, uh, yeah, would enable tons of uh, further discussions. Um, but, uh, but I, I think the missions, of course, the mission statements, they, they all sound good and make sense. Um, but as you said, of course, incentives, um, are, are probably very, where you have to get at if you want to, uh, if you want to really get to these missions. And I was just wondering if this is in your book or if, 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 uh, to what extent you've thought about this, this about the organization or the, say the, the objective function really of the college administrations and, uh, so I mean, in my mind, which is maybe cynical, but uh, I think personal networks like alumni and firms and schools, they play a very important role for brand. Uh, then the quality of students that select themselves and that are selected into the program. So, and, and, and these two dimensions, I would think they generate certain network effects, which uh, disincentivize scaling and opening up um, schools. So, uh, and, and I think these structures seem to be very difficult to break up to actually get to those missions. Um, so I'm not sure if that, you know, so, so, and so that's, that's my point. So, so, so in a way it's, it's a question, you know, is that what we should really mostly worry about or should we be more, um, I don't know, um, you know, not be too much economists and, and, uh, and say, okay, incentives, they're so difficult to deal with here that we should just try to, I don't know. Well, so the, and to the more normative stuff, yeah. The chapter I'm working on right now is arguing that, um, you know, the question is why did Clay Christensen wrote about this 15 years ago and said that colleges would be disrupted in, you know, in five to seven years um, and it hasn't happened. And what I'm trying to argue is I'm not sure Clay Christensen's demand side disruptive change applies here as well as Josh Gans's supply side disruptive change. So Avi, shout out to, you, to your colleague. Um, but what Josh, Josh Gans says is there's another type of disruption. You know, what, the way I characterize Christensen's disruption is you don't see the threat until it's too late. The way I characterize um, uh, Josh Gans's disruption is you see the threat immediately and you just recognize that there's nothing you can do about it because responding to it would mean, be, would mean investing just like the entrant invests. Um, I, I sort of think we in higher education are facing that second kind of disruption where when we look at this, we say, hey, none of my deans, none of my department heads, you know, none of my alumni are gonna be on board with this change. So I'm gonna to try to ride out the current system for as long as I can at least until retirement, which in my case is only about 10 years from now. Mike, your hand is up. If we can go a little bit over time as my classes almost always do. 
No, I, I was just going to suggest the, uh, a, a history chapter because I was wondering what other sort of disruptions to this industry have, have affected things. So I don't know if you have a history chapter, but like the Morrell Act and the land grant institutions, what did they do to the private universities? The, what came out of that Truman Commission was the community colleges were very huge. And what does that do to lower tier universities like mine? Uh, and you know, how did they change their business model to cope with this? And, and I guess now with the private universities. Uh, um. chapter, oh. chapter two is the, is the history chapter. And I think just a, a two sentence summary is basically what we did around the period of industrialization is we radically expanded access to college. And there's a whole bunch of wonderful quotes that talk about expanding access, basically paralleling the manufacturing technology of the day. So we took education from a craft industry and turned it into an assembly line industry. Um, and, and again, a bunch of quotes that almost say exactly that. What I'm trying to argue is assembly lines are great, but we now have the technology to do mass customization, the, you know, the, the manufacturing on demand, blah, blah, blah. What might it look like to create an educational system that adopts some of these technologies? Um, but yeah, chap chapter two, you're hundred percent right, Mike. Other thoughts, friends? All right, my email is on the last slide. If anybody, if anybody wants to yell at me in person, send me an email. Um, if anybody's curious about reading any of these chapters, I'd love to show you and, and get feedback. And I really appreciate your time.